Me? Good. You're live. All right. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Well, today I want to continue then talking about the Pacific War. And we were talking about that uh, a little bit yesterday. Uh, Pacific War is, I think, the most brutal theater of the Second World War. Uh, and uh, things happened there that did not happen anywhere else in the Second World War. And that's not to say that in Europe it was not a brutal war. It was absolutely, you know, war is horrible. I don't care where it is and when it is. But I think uh, the worst war was the uh, Pacific War, and I also think that was the American War, although uh, we have uh, New Zealanders, we have Australians, the Chinese, uh, the uh, Vietnamese, uh, and uh, Pacific Islanders, people in the Pacific Islands, uh, aid the uh, Allied cause, but by and large, it was uh, an American war. The greatest number of casualties are American. Uh, and plus this, the Japanese were very tough soldiers. I think when we left off yesterday, we were talking about the Bushido Code, uh, and Bushido literally translates as the way of the warrior. Uh, and it uh, can be summed up pretty easily, uh, no surrender. Uh, if it became, you know, under the Japanese code, if it became apparent that uh, resist, further resistance was futile, uh, you were going to die anyway, uh, suicide, suicide. Uh, the uh, hurrah kari, uh, which Americans came home pronouncing it Harry Carey, but hurrah kari. A lot of Japanese officers, especially when it became apparent that the battle was lost on these islands, they would take, and it was a ceremony, it would, you take a ritual knife and you disembowel yourself, okay? And that was the uh, traditional way of suicide, again, especially for Japanese officers. Uh, the Japanese soldiers, uh, their tactics can only be described, I think, as uh, fanaticism. Uh, and this fanaticism that they had, the death, victory or death, this fanaticism they had, uh, led to them fighting the Japanese army, as good as it was, led to them fighting uh, in some rather idiotic ways. In fact, uh, you know, when these little islands start to fall, what's going to happen is one by one, these islands are going to be taken by the Allies. But again, when it became apparent, when the Japanese garrison was confined to one small corner of one small island, and it became apparent that they were going to be wiped out, uh, they would uh, conduct what was called a bonsai charge, okay? Bonsai. Uh, bonsai means a thousand years. In other words, may the emperor live a thousand years. It's sort of like saying, long live the king. It was this final salute to the emperor. And just before the charge happened, uh, uh, the wounded in the hospitals would be given a pistol. Or they would be given a hand grenade. Or if there were a shortage of pistols and hand grenades and ammunition, the soldier would just simply walk up and uh, shoot the man uh, in the head. But if you couldn't participate in the charge, you were expected uh, to uh, commit suicide, and then they would just all of a sudden fling themselves out across open terrain, uh, screaming at the top of their lungs, and the result of this was always a slaughter. Uh, the uh, Allied forces had had uh, their weapons aligned. They knew exactly what to expect, and they just obliterated, literally mowed down thousands of Japanese soldiers uh, for no purpose at all. There was nothing, there was absolutely nothing gained by this. Again, it's just ritual suicide. Rather than surrender, rather than surrender, um, you uh, died, okay? Uh, the, Bush the Bushido Code, okay? Uh, and a lot of the Japanese uh, soldiers, or some of the Japanese soldiers, once it became apparent that they were going to lose the battle, that the Allies were gonna, going to overrun this little island that they were on, uh, they would go out and hide in the jungles, and they would continue uh, to fight on. And at night, they would sneak into the nearest American camp and they would go through the garbage and they would uh, get enough uh, th uh, leftover food or food that had been thrown away to sustain themselves. One very comical thing happened. I don't know which island it was on, but uh, once the island was pretty well secured, they sent in a movie screen and they started showing movies to these Marines and sailors and others who had been through hell on earth. And after one movie, you know, there's a large crowd of these guys just sitting out in the jungle watching this movie screen. But after one movie, when it was over and they turned up the lights uh, and everybody stood up to cheer, there was a Japanese soldier who had sneaked in, who had been out hiding in the jungle. He had just been there watching the movie. And he sort of stood up and just gave this little sheepish grin and everybody kind of laughed and they took him prisoner. And that was that. 
Uh, but the Japanese even fight on when the war is over. Uh, this man right here, and you don't have to write him down, but this is just an illustration of what I'm talking about. He's the last Japanese soldier to surrender in World War II. And his name was uh, Hiro Anata. okay? Hiro Anata. When do you think he surrendered? Remembering that the war ends in 1945. He was in the Philippines. And when the Philippines fell, he just fell back. Out. He was an officer. He was, I think, a lieutenant. And he simply fell back in the jungle and he stayed back there and he would come out of the jungle and he would steal chickens from Filipino farmers. And that's how he sustained himself. But the war ended in 45. When do you think he finally surrendered? Which year? Guess? 45? No, he, he goes on beyond 45. He didn't surrender until 1974. Okay. He stayed out. And this, and when, you know, he finally comes in, uh, and here he is when he uh, surrenders, when he, you know, he's uh, turning over his sword. This is a Filipino officer here, but he's turning over his sword. And, of course, he became a great cult hero in Japan. Uh, he comes back, and he's the toast of Japan for a while. But when they asked him, why did you do it? And he said, you know, we were taught that you, you fought on until the emperor gave you his personal permission to surrender. And so in 1974, he finally figured out or thought that resistance was useless and, uh, he came in and he surrendered. Also, get this down. So, 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 the Americans and their allies are fighting against a dogged, tough uh, uh, opponent out in the or enemy out in the uh, the Pacific. Uh, and of course, the Pacific was the first real amphibious war. I want you to get that down. Amphibious war. I'm going to show you the next time the whole class is together. Amphibious war. I'm going to show you a, a little film clip uh, from uh, the D-Day invasion from Saving Private Ryan. It's very good, and you'll see amphibious warfare there as well. But uh, the Pacific uh, is the first real amphibious war, and that's where you load uh, troops, pack them in this little uh, LST, uh, and uh, you send them uh, uh, toward the shore, and that thing will hit, and it sort of crawls up about halfway on the shore, and the front door of it drops down and they go storming out on the beach. That really had never been done in warfare before. The way that Pacific War is fought, uh, the uh, planners would pick out an island. Here you have a small island. Some of these islands are a mile long. I mean, they're not as long as the downtown area of you fall, but you've got this small island here. And of course, I told you earlier that the battleships were on the way out, but the battleships uh, performed one last service during World War II, they would uh, take these big battleships, battle wagons, they called them, and uh, they would surround the island and they would bombard it for several days. At the same time, there would be aircraft carriers out here and they would launch their planes and they would be bombing the island. But then, then would come uh, D-Day and they would load uh, troops in uh, these uh, troop carriers, this landing craft, and they would go rapidly ashore, and those things, like I say, would sort of work their way up uh, out of the tide up on the shore, and then they would drop, uh, and the troops would go storming out, and, uh, you know, the battle would commence. <clears throat> to show you how efficient the United States became in doing this, because we do it on, you know, at first we don't, we're not too good at it, like anything else you do for the first time. There are a lot of mistakes and a lot of glitches, but to show you how good the United States got at this, at the Battle of Saipan, and I'm not going to talk about all these battles, but I'm going to write them down, and I want you to write them down. And I, I won't ask you probably, well, I think I can tell you, I won't ask you anything about Saipan. But, you know, every American, if they ever hear that word Saipan for the rest of their life, should remember that Saipan was a small island out in the Pacific and thousands of Americans died taking that, taking that island. It's a Pacific battle. You shouldn't hear Saipan and say, well, gee, was that in Korea or Vietnam? No, it was in World War II. And, and at least 1,000 Americans and maybe more, more died at Saipan. But I just picked Saipan out, it's a, not only because it's a, a bloody battle, but I pick it out because um, uh, at Saipan, to show you how efficient we eventually became in this uh, beach landing, uh, amphibious warfare, uh, they put 8,000 men ashore with full combat gear. Just think about this, 8,000 men. Usually at this point in the lecture, I will ask, 
is there anybody here in the band? And somebody will say, yes, are you in the band? Are you in the band? Somebody will say, yes, we're in the band. And I'll say, well, on the first day of band practice in late July, uh, you know, how many appeal? Oh, there are 60 or 70 or 80 people. There are 60 or 70 or 80. Well, how long is it? Does everybody just line up and start playing? Oh, no, no. You know, it takes us several days to create our formation, find out where we're supposed to be. Well, that's with 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 people. Just think about this. At Saipan, the United States put 8,000 Marines ashore with full combat gear in 20 minutes. That's pretty impressive. 8,000 people ashore in 20 minutes, ready to fight. Not only ready to fight, but fighting, okay? Um, Admiral Chester Nimitz, okay, was the... Uh, that's my guard here. Uh, yeah. Admiral Chester Nimitz, I've shown you a picture of him, I think. Admiral Nimitz was the uh, uh, commander in chief. He was in charge. Well, I just you, you can write you can write it however you want. You can, you know, the Navy they're famous for using uh, 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 acronyms. Uh, they call it uh, Sync Pack. Okay, commander in chief in the Pacific, but that's what he was. You can write it however you want. Uh, Chester Nimitz. Chester Nimitz was in charge of the Pacific War. <clears throat> in the Southwest Pacific, get this down, the Southwest Pacific, you had this man, Douglas MacArthur, okay? Douglas MacArthur. But MacArthur actually served under Nimitz. Nimitz is in charge of the whole show, okay? Nimitz is in charge of the whole show. And um, the... Um, Pacific Theater of the War, get this down, the Pacific Theater of the War is going to be divided into two parts, okay? Get this down, two parts. <clears throat> and I'll show you right here. Here's Australia, here's Japan, uh, there are the Philippine Islands, okay? Uh, and of course, uh, in the Pacific War, get this, the Pacific War, the uh, campaign to take back the Pacific is called island hopping, okay, island hopping, the island hopping campaign. And again, Nimitz, the Navy Admiral, he's not a general, he's a Navy Admiral. Nimitz was in charge of all that. And it was divided into two parts, okay? But it starts here at Guadalcanal. Write that down, okay? Guadalcanal. That's where Guadalcanal. That's where the war to take back the Pacific begins, okay, at the Battle of Guadalcanal. And once Guadalcanal is secured, it's a very bloody battle, once Guadalcanal is secured, uh, you can see it lasts from August of 42 until November of 43 and before it's really secured. Once Guadalcanal is secured, then the Allied invasion is going to move north, always heading toward Japan, but it's going to divide into two parts, all right? And look, you've got the Central Pacific, okay, the Central Pacific moving here. And then here you have the Southern Pacific. And of course, uh, MacArthur is in charge of the Southern Pacific. The overall commander out of Pearl Harbor is Admiral Nimitz. Nothing happened that Admiral Nimitz did not approve of, okay? Uh, no plan was put into effect without his approval. Uh, and the goal of the Central Pacific, get this down, I mean, they go right here, some of the worst fighting of the Pacific War. They go right through the heart of the Pacific. And what the Central Pacific did, the Central Pacific Theater of the War, what their goal is is to capture islands, okay, from which to launch air raids against Japan. Capture islands in which to launch air raids against Japan. And again, you know, they're going to fight at a place called Tarawa. We'll talk about that later. And Guam, and there's Saipan. We just mentioned it in the Mariana Islands. And then there's the very bloody battle of Iwo Jima. But both of these movements through the Central Pacific and the Southern Pacific, uh, both of these movements, their ultimate goal right here, you can see that probably, is Okinawa. Write that down, Okinawa. And once Okinawa, the, the plan was, once Okinawa was captured, Okinawa, once Okinawa was captured, 
then the final invasion of Japan would take place. All of this bloody, horrific fighting leading up to Okinawa from 1942 to 1945 is just a preliminary. Because once they had Okinawa, they thought the main uh, contest of the, of the Pacific War would begin, and that was the conquest of four Japanese home islands. Uh, but that invasion never took place, and we'll talk about that, but that invasion never took place. I mean, they're on Okinawa, they're getting ready to go, and then two atomic bombs are dropped, and that will end the war. So the final invasion of Japan, thank goodness, for both the Americans and Japan, the final and the American allies, but it was mainly Americans at, at Okinawa, the, the, uh, the uh, final invasion for both the Americans and the Japanese, thank goodness, never ever took place. And we are going to talk in detail about uh, several of these things. <coughs> the Central Pacific, though, is to get bases from which to bomb uh, Japan. In fact, the uh, right here in the Mariana Islands, uh, Saipan, uh, is the bloodiest battle fought in the Mariana Islands, but they also captured a little island as part of that uh, archipelago that was called Tinian. Write this down, Tinian, in the Marianas. Or I guess when the Marianas fell, Tinian fell too. But Tinian is, from, is, is, is the, the island from which the, atomic, the planes carrying the atomic bombs were flown, okay? The Southern Pacific Campaign, the Southern Pacific Campaign, its goal is the Philippine Islands and then Okinawa. And that's exactly what MacArthur's going to do. He's going to go along the northern coast of Indonesia. In 1944, he will, re, he will retake the Philippines for the United States. Uh, and then, of course, uh, they're getting ready to join the American forces in Okinawa when the atomic bomb is dropped. So the one of the goals of the Southern Pacific is the Phil is the Philippine Islands, and again we'll talk about the Philippine Islands and the fighting there. For example, the greatest naval battle in history—you can probably see it there—and we'll talk about. You don't have to know the now. It's Leyte Gulf in October of 1944. That's where the Japanese Navy ceased to exist at Leyte Gulf. But I'll talk about that in greater detail maybe in just a few minutes. Okay. So anyway, uh, that uh, is is the broad overview of what the Pacific War was all about. And one other thing, this island hopping, get this down, involves something else. You know, look, the Japanese, by the time the Americans enter the war and begin the reconquest of the Pacific, the Japanese had dug in on many, many islands throughout the Pacific. The goal was not to take every island. That's not the goal of the Pacific War. Uh, it's island hopping. And island hopping involved this. Uh, bypass, whenever possible, bypass um, the most heavily fortified Japanese islands, okay? Just cut them off, just cut them off from Japan. And a perfect example of that is right here, if you'll take a look. <clears throat> MacArthur, <clears throat> heading for the Philippines, essentially ignores Indonesia. The Japanese had over close to 200, look at this, 200,000 men down there in Indonesia because they thought the Americans would launch an attack straight from Australia, the Allies would launch an attack straight from Australia to Indonesia. And rather than fight your way across all of those islands, losing thousands of men, uh, what the Americans did is they simply bypassed it and headed toward the Philippines. And these guys here, this 150,000 or 200,000, whatever it was, Japanese the soldiers were just cut off. Uh, they're just left to wither on the vine. They're cut off from their supply base. They're starving to death down there. It turns into a pretty horrible situation. But thousands of Americans didn't die. We, we just ignored uh, Indonesia and uh, went on. And we did that. Well, we tried to bypass. When you talk about the island hopping, the uh, Allies tried to bypass the most uh, uh, heavily fortified, uh, heavily fortified Japanese uh, bases in the Pacific. Some of them uh, heavily fortified places, as you're going to see right now, some of those places the United States invaded and they fought and they lost thousands of men. But whenever possible, they tried to bypass it. And as I say, the fighting was horrible. As I say, the jumping off point was Guadalcanal. 
Now, here's another one for you, and just an example of how terrible the fighting in the Pacific was. And here's here's another one that no uh, American uh, should forget, and that is the uh, Battle of uh, Tarawa. Here, okay, you have Guadalcanal first, and then in November of 1943, uh, the Battle at Tarawa. Okay, and I just want to describe a little bit uh, to you about the fighting at Tarawa. Tarawa was in the Gilbert Islands. It was about two miles long and a half a mile wide. Again, it's about as big, really, as downtown Eufaula. And that doesn't seem like a very, very large place. The, the Japanese commander on that little island had 5,000 men defending it. And he said this. He said it would take a million men 100 years. This is what he said. He said it will take a million men 100 years to take this island. Well, uh, this is the, really the first real amphibious, large amphibious result. We sort of have that at Guadalcanal, but then, you know, we're sort of feeling our oats. So we're going to really launch a major amphibious assault, and that happened at Tarawa. Um, <clears throat> and the Americans took it, you know, this guy said a million men would take them 100 years. The Americans took Tarawa in 72 hours. But to show you how ferocious the fighting was, only 30% of the first wave of troops, just think about that. The first guys off the landing craft on, and on this little small island. It's just like, it's, it's like invading downtown Eufaula. That's not much of an exaggeration. And only 30% of the first wave of troops made it ashore. At this battle, there was one, I always tell this story, it's too good to pass up. There was one, it's close to your age, one 19 year old Marine and he was going ashore with that first wave. and. Uh, he was heading toward a Japanese machine gun nest, and on, the, on either side of the machine gunner, the guy down there firing the machine gun, there were two Japanese soldiers, and they were throwing hand grenades toward the Americans. And this young 19-year-old Marine caught the first five hand grenades and threw them back, okay? And the sixth hand grenade he caught, it blew his, uh, well, it, I don't think it blew his hand off, but it blew up in his hand, and it injured his hand and arm, and he had to be taken out of the battle uh, to be treated for that, for that wound. Uh, in 72 hours, the Americans took that island. A thousand Americans died. It's like having, again, having a battle to take downtown Eufaula, and it takes, it lasted 72 hours, and a thousand people died. Out of the Japanese garrison of 5,000, only 17 defenders survived. Tarawa today, if you were to go into the Marine Corps, when you get to boot camp, before you really start your training, they'll probably take you in an auditorium, and they'll show you films and give you lectures about the proud history of the United States Marines. And Tarawa, of all the engagements that the Marines have fought in in the last 250 years, uh, Tarawa is called, and I quote, the proudest, the proudest and the most terrible day in the history of the United States uh, Marine Corps. Uh, well, next uh, they move up, and we've already written it down, but next uh, they move uh, from Tarawa uh, up to Saipan here, okay? There, there's Japan, uh, up to Saipan. And I want to just say a word about Saipan. Um, by the time the United States gets to Saipan, uh, they have, they're, they're going to attack, and it's not a very large island. They're going to attack that island with 600 ships, uh, something like 3,000 planes, and uh, 300,000 men, 300,000 men. Uh, and at Saipan, there were Japanese civilians. I think I might have mentioned this the other day. At Saipan, there were Japanese civilians. And those civilians had been told that Amer all Americans, but especially United States Marines, were devils. In fact, they said uh, if the Marines, to, to get into the Marines, I think I mentioned this the other day, to get into the Marines, you had to kill your own family uh, and roast them and cook them and eat them, Okay. And they assured all of these civilians, and a lot of them were the wives of soldiers. The, the Japanese had a thing called comfort girls, where they send young girls down, and those girls act as prostitutes for the Japanese soldiers down there. But there was a large population of civilians, women and children there, and they indoctrinated those women and children, and they told them that uh, if you were fell into the hands of an American, especially a Marine, and that's who's doing most of the fighting here. If you fell into the hands of an American, then first you would be blinded, and then uh, you would be castrated, and then you would be cooked. And the Americans brought these big, ferocious dogs with them, and they amused themselves by cooking 
dead Japanese and throwing their bodies uh, to the dogs and the dogs would eat them. And so Japanese soldiers, just before the attack began, they passed out cyanide capsules. Some of them are giving cyanide capsules, by the way, to their own uh, wives and children. They passed out cyanide capsules to them uh, or they shot them, they shot their own wives and children or to save ammunition, they beheaded them. OK, with a ceremonial sword to save ammunition. So uh, the battle starts. The Americans are winning, and there was a uh, there was a uh, point on the northern end of the island called Marpai Point, Marpai. And uh, of course, as the American forces advanced, the Japanese fell back, <coughs> and finally they're hemmed in at Marpai Point. And uh, that's, this is when the Americans send up Japanese Americans, the Nisi, with louds, with, with, with bullhorns, and they're speaking pristine, pure Japanese. There could be no mistaking it, and they're telling those women and children to surrender. You know, no harm will come to you. You know, come out and surrender. But rather than do that, mothers, some of them holding little babies, some of them holding a young child by the hand in each hand, they will jump off. Marpai Point is the tallest point on the island. It's a tall cliff overlooking the Pacific. And they jumped and they committed a ritual suicide. And there were so many bodies of dead Japanese civilians floating around Saipan that a lot of the American ships participating in the invasion, they got the bodies caught up, caught up uh, in the screws of the ship. You know what I'm talking about, the thing that, and the ship literally could not navigate and they had to send down, you know, when I say war is hell, imagine having to live with this for the rest of your life, but they had to send down divers under there to remove the bodies of dead Japanese who had committed suicide, men, women, and children from the screws of the ship so the ship could continue uh, to operate. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's just a little picture. When I talk about the horror of the Pacific War. That's just a little picture of that. And, and really, God help you if you uh, fell prisoners. I said to you the other day, uh, about 4% of uh, POWs in German uh, prison camps, about 4% um, actually uh, died. Uh, but in Japan, it was 26. In, in Japanese prison camps, it was 26%. Okay. Well, on October 20th, 1944, one other thing, uh, on October 20th, 1944, MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur landed in the Philippine Islands. And even before the battle was over, and it's quite a ferocious battle. And by the way, if you want to read about some of the atrocities committed by Japanese soldiers as the Japanese are retreating, especially in Manila, uh, they do horrible things to the Filipino people because they considered the Filipino people to be, that's what they call them, they call them race traitors because they were fighting on the side of, uh, they were Asians who were fighting on the side of the Allied forces. Uh, and uh, here is MacArthur going ashore. Now, they, he staged that two or three times. He has a film crew with him. MacArthur's a show-off and a prima donna, uh, and uh, he hopes to be president of the United States, and he thinks that his war record will make him that. And so there's the landing craft, they go, and there's his staff, and they go wading ashore. And then they just showed him the film when he got up on the shore and he didn't like it. So he goes back and they take the landing craft and they go back. And I think they did this three or four times, you know. But that's one of the iconic pictures of World War II, MacArthur waiting ashore in the Philippines. And by the way, when he gets ashore, they had a microphone hooked up for him. And he gives this speech and he says, get this down. What did he say? When he, what was his famous quote when he uh, left the Philippines? I shall return. Okay, and I think I'll be back as Arnold Schwarzenegger in the movie. But anyway, MacArthur said, I shall return. Well, in October 44, he returned. And when he returned, <clears throat> he said to them, people of the Philippines, <clears throat> people of the Philippines, this is all being broadcast on local radio, people of the Philippines, I have returned. Rally, rally to me. Okay, rally to me. And uh, there he is again. Waiting ashore, same same day, same moment. And today, out there where that took place, you know, there you see some tourists there, but you see it, you see how tall this is. But these are, I guess, bronze statues uh, taken from that photo there. And there's the guy in the sun hat. So there he is. But those are bronze, and that's MacArthur 
out there in the Philippines and forever he will be he will be striding ashore. The Philippines was a long and desperate fight. I, I don't know if you know this, but there are when you talk about the Philippine Islands, I shouldn't say the Philippines. When you talk about the Philippine Islands, there are seven thousand Philippine Islands. Now, of course, the Japanese aren't. Some of them aren't much bigger than this room. The Japanese aren't dug in on every one, but they have to fight from the south to the north, and it is a long uh, battle. And of course, the Americans didn't have any shore installations. They're being supplied by their fleet offshore. And so Japan, in an effort to stop the Americans, get this down, they're going to send what was left of their Navy down to the Philippines, including this ship. This is the Yamato, a great heavy cruiser, the Yamato, or maybe it's a battleship. Anyway, the Yamato. And here's the American Navy offshore, and they're going to send their fleet and the last aircraft carriers, including the last aircraft carriers they have, and they're going to try and sink the U.S. Navy. And the strategy behind that is about the only strategy left to them, in fact. But the strategy behind that is if we sink the Navy, the Americans will run out of supplies, and they will be forced to retreat. And these two fleet, and by the way, the Japanese Navy had barely, the Yamato had enough fuel, for example, this great battleship, the Yamato, had enough fuel to make it to the Philippines, but that was it. Uh, it couldn't return home. So every one of those sailors on that ship knew uh, that they were going uh, on a uh, suicide mission. And the two fleets are going to meet at a place called Leyte Gulf. Always associate that, Leyte Gulf with the Philippines, Leyte Gulf, and it's the largest naval battle in history, Leyte Gulf. 300, pardon me, 300 ships and 200 men. Of course, by this time in the war, the United States, and this is really the first aircraft war, aircraft carrier war. There were some a few aircraft carriers around World War One, but very few. This is the World War II is the first aircraft war, and we've got sixteen aircraft carriers down there at the Philippines. At the time, we've got about one hundred and forty aircraft carriers. Okay, but we've got sixteen of them there in task. It was called Task Force Fifty Eight. And just think about this: those sixteen aircraft carriers, Task Force Fifty Eight. Those 16 aircraft carriers could put a thousand, just think about the efficiency and the, uh, that this took. Uh, those uh, 16 aircraft carriers could launch a thousand planes, put a thousand planes up in the air in 30 minutes, which is to say the Japanese were sitting ducks. They absolutely didn't have a chance. At one point in the Battle of Leyte Gulf, an American, uh, American fighter planes <coughs> shot down 60 uh, Japanese fighter planes in 15 minutes, in 15 minutes. This Leyte Gulf is the end of the Japanese Navy. The Japanese lost their last four aircraft carriers, three battleships, 12 destroyers. And I'm never going to ask you all these statistics, but 12,000 sailors, 12,000 sailors. To say the fighting was fierce at Leyte Gulf is an understatement. I want to bring this close to home. At one point, at one point, uh, the, Yama, the Yama, Yamato was coming through Leyte Gulf, leading the Japanese task force. <clears throat> and there was uh, an American uh, commander uh, who was a graduate of Muskogee High School uh, named Captain Ernest Evans. Maybe I've got a picture of Ernest Evans up here. It shows you the guns on a battleship, okay? Pretty ferocious. There he is. Well, uh, I'll wait until the next time we lecture to talk about this. We'll just stop right in the middle of Leyte Gulf, and um, uh, we'll take it up there the next time I have a lecture with uh, Leyte Gulf, and we'll finish the battle and go on. But for now, study all your notes down to Leyte Gulf. It may not – all of those things, for you folks out in television land, all of these things may not be – on the, the test, but they might, so take a look at all of them.